Good evening, everybody. Welcome, to everyone. After a week off, it's good to see everybody here. And we have a very, very special guest. Tuesday nights, we always have special guests try to give you some uh, insight into some of the things that are going around around Klai Yisrael. And of course, for the last few months, as always, Eretz Yisrael has been on our mind. And tonight, we have somebody who is protecting Eretz Yisrael and Klai Yisrael in two somewhat different, but really ultimately the same way uh, by... Uh, uh, physically and spiritually as well. And that is Rabbi Yosef Davis, who we will spotlight. And here he is. Rabbi, first of all, thank you so much for taking some time to be with us. You're on the East Coast. It's an hour later. We really appreciate it. So welcome. And tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why we're so interested in meeting with you tonight. Hi, thank you so much, Rabbi Epstein, for having me on the uh, the. Zoom call and Zoom meet, uh, you know, a great Kahila. Um, familiar with everybody from uh, from Moshe Wolf, who I served with in the IDF uh, most recently in a place right south of Hebron called Shima. Uh, beautiful, beautiful place aesthetically. Um, surrounded by uh, many Arab villages, and there's a high level, high need, and a high level of defense going on over there now. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, so hopefully we'll see that you know, dissipate soon and we'll have peace and uh, not have to have such a strong force there soon. Um, yes. And, uh, and, and again, thank you for having me. It's an honor. It's a pleasure. Um, Torah anytime is my, my day job and uh, okay. uh, you know, so, soldier when, when necessary. Um, a soldier always, we're all soldiers of Hashem. We're all soldiers in Hashem's mm -hmm. army, so to speak, living out our soul's purpose in this world and uh, all doing everything that we can, especially in this uh, situation that we find ourselves in now, uh, being that uh, it's so dire. And uh, it's a very, there's a very stark contrast between what's going on in Israel and what's going on in America. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how many people on the Zoom call now are from uh, from the United States, would say everybody or? Yeah, we're all, we're all red, white, and blue. And, and uh, if anybody has been to Israel recently, they'll notice that uh, there's, you know, there's a lot more uh, men gone from from everywhere. The, the country's pretty much being run by teenage girls. And when you walk into stores and uh, everybody who's behind a counter, uh, the, all the the army eligible aged people are are gone, and uh, and and the wives are holding it together, and families are you know doing the best that they can. Uh, and uh, on the on the flip side of that, there is such a spirit of of achdus, of togetherness, and of love, and everybody's taking care of each other. I had strangers who were offering to do my laundry mm -hmm. uh, never happened to me in my life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's just incredible the, the the amount of resources that are missing, but also the amount of resources that are so shored up by people just doing everything that they can, everything they could think of, putting themselves out. And, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough definitely get going. Amazing. So that's the uh, the attitude over so there. So you now. are one of those tough guys. Let's unpack a lot of the things that are going on. So give us, if you don't mind, a little bit of just your personal life story and how you wound up in the IDF and your experience. I mean, everybody, of course, October 7th comes. And what's that like for a soldier, uh, someone in the reserves living here in the United States? If you could just share with us a little bit of, uh, of what your experience was, perhaps your background, how you wound up in the IDF, and then what October 7th meant for someone, again, with military experience. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Passaic, New Jersey, North Jersey. Um, I lived in, in many places uh, since then. Uh, one of them being after after yeshiva, I went to uh, my, my family. The background is uh, members of young Israel when we were growing up. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I took a break. I took a nice break from uh, from Yiddishkeit, from, from Jewish practice, from the age of like, uh, let's say, 12 to 18 years old. And uh, really just uh, finding myself and my own path and my own journey. And uh, I was doing things that I saw relevance in and, and that I that I loved and appreciated and, and not doing things that I, that I didn't want to do. Uh, so I never had, uh, you know, a... a uh, um, I never had a falling out with with religion, but I was taking a break and discovering who I was. And yes, you could say twelve years twelve year twelve years old is very young to do that, but uh, that's just how I felt. And my parents were 
really supportive, loving. Uh, my mom is an artist and my father is a manufacturer and uh, he does a lot of uh, signs on buildings and trophies and things like that. Uh, so he's a blue collar, you know, just going out to work and it taught me a very strong work ethic growing up. And uh, my, uh, you know, my grandparents are, my grandfather's side is, uh, he's, you know, American second generation, but before that, Russia. Uh, and my my grandmother's side uh, is, is Hungarian, and I have Polish on my mom's side. I have a whole smattering of uh, Eastern Europe in me, like the most Ashkenazic Jews. And uh, I remember being 16, 17 years old, I was sitting on the stairs on my stoop, and I would read the paper in the morning, and uh, my stoop at my parents' house. And uh, just I, I saw you know, another terror attack, another thing about the Intifada, this going on, that going on. And, and I remember just feeling so uh, upset is not the word, but feeling very, very, uh, how could they do this to us? How could we stand by while, while people, you know, while we're the peace loving, God fearing people that we are uh, and, and wanting to bring the world to a better place and standing for truth and justice and peace and righteousness. And how can we have these enemies who are coming in and and with intent and purpose to, to to mess us up in every way that they can? It was just so so wrong, and I felt that injustice deeply. And I think that was where this spark uh, in me was was uh, the spark of indignation, the spark of of passion, where it eventually led me on my journey after uh, I finished high school. Um, I was in yeshiva, but then I was in public school. Um, I worked in the, the food industry and culinary industry. I went to culinary school, became a chef. Uh, and then after my high school years, I got my GED. I worked in, in a bunch of different uh, capacities in the restaurant industry. And then I was off to Israel. And that's where I really uh, found people that I, I wanted to emulate and I wanted to be like for the first time in my life. I could say that uh, besides for some coaches that I had and some good uh, teachers and Rebellion that I had connections with in, in the States. Uh, I was on my own for the first time in my life. I was exploring, I was discovering uh, more of who I am in a much more deep and real spiritual way. Uh, I had an older sister who went to school in the old city. She was in the seminary there and she was a big, very big influence on me. She said, you know, rather than go to college, you know, take some time off and uh, I want you to come, come to Israel for the year you know, experience what we have to offer over here. It's a great country. You're going to love it. I guarantee you. Uh, she found me a great place to go to. I was in a, a yeshiva called Or Sameach, which uh, was a fantastic place. And it was a perfect place for me. Um, I you know sat in the courtyard, listened to Masilak uh, Desharim, Shirim, and, you know, classes on uh, the, the path of the just. And, and uh, you know, the, the learning just uh, filled me up with a sense of, of pride of who I was, of understanding that I'm a Jewish person in this world. And, you know, it, uh, I looked into Christianity and Buddhism and all other world religions you can imagine. And, uh, you know, none of them spoke to me. And, and at the end of the day, I was in an environment where I was surrounded by some of the most inspiring and, and wonderful people that I had ever met in my life. And uh, so I ended up in, in a yeshiva afterwards. I, I wanted to do some, some higher learning. Uh, get more into Gemara and my tractate skills. And I was in a school, it's, uh, it's called Kumbachon Meir. And that school was uh, run by Rabbi Dov Begun, who was uh, around since 1948, the times of the formation of the country, and very Tzioni, very Zionistic place. They had an English speakers program, and it was like the, the world, uh, just a, a melting pot of a wonderful different personalities from a, an American program, there's a Russian program, an Israeli program, French, Spanish, and I think one other language I'm forgetting, but it was just such an amazing place where everybody got together and uh, it was such a sense of brotherhood. And that around that time, I found out there's an opportunity to do a program called Hesder. Hesder is army service mixed with yeshiva learning, with Torah learning, and uh, kind of a joint hybrid type program. Uh, I got more interested in it. I had a friend, my roommate at the time was uh, going to a unit called uh, Nachal. And uh, I came down with him to the office to go and uh, just you know, check things out, see what the situation was like, what I would need to, to do. Uh, but rather than go back to America and go to university, uh, I decided, you know, like all my friends were doing after yeshiva, or most of them anyway, the ones who weren't staying to stay on and, and learn for, uh, you know, the second, third, fourth year, uh, they, they, uh, you know, most people went back and I, I decided to enroll, to enlist. And um, I 
they actually funny story not so funny story they lost all my paperwork <laughs> and as fate would have it i get a call i thought i was going in and you know the, the next month i'm waiting for the call and i get a call from uh somebody in very broken english who says um, uh, yes you know about uh, your army service uh, we don't uh, have any of your papers uh, so <laughs> sorry but uh, you have to start again <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, it's a, a, a gloomy day because uh, I, I had invested my whole future of my life thinking I was going, and uh, I guess where there's a will, there's a way. Yesh ratzon, yesh derech, and uh, I decided I was going to go you know, start again. And uh, as Hashem would have it, I made it to uh, a, a totally different unit than Nachal. Uh, it was a unit called Shimshon. Shimshon is a specialized unit that was created just for the area of Gaza. Uh, many units shift every three, four months. They go to different areas because we want to uh, keep the enemies on their toes and uh, not, you know, have anybody too familiar with one place. This unit was made, created specifically for Gaza, for Gaza, and uh, so I, I know the area very well. Uh, and I ended up serving there. Ended up being a short range uh, sniper, a sharpshooter, if you will. Um, I wasn't sitting out for for three four days at a time in a ghillie suit, but uh, I was uh, patrolling the fence along the uh, the border between Israel and and Gaza. And I spent my my service uh, guarding an industrial area where people from Gaza would come in to work during the day, and people from Israel would also come in Arab Arab Israelis and Israelis. And it was our job to just protect the area, make sure that nobody that wasn't supposed to be coming into Israel was coming into Israel. Uh, pretty uh, high risk area when you have a lot of different hundreds of different workers in different factories in this industrial area, and uh, and then guarding the fence and and the wall that's uh, you know by the area of uh, Beit Hanun, the name of the neighborhood. Um, so that's that was my service. That's what I did. Uh, fast forwarding, you know, to 2006 when I got out of the military. Uh, I was uh, learning with my friends in the back of a shul, Noach Isaac Olbaum shul in Queens on 73rd Avenue. And we were just a you know, group of kids who came in. We were in our 20s at the time. And uh, the rabbi is a, a rub of the kahila of the congregation, much like uh, Rabbi Epstein. He would come and he would, he would he would give us love and he would give us attention and he would just, you know, just be there for us and, and, and teach us Torah, uh, mostly before the holidays. One one class uh, I was in, I saw somebody with a video camera there. I approached them afterwards and I said, you know, what are you doing with, with the camera here? This is a small group of guys. We're not like an official school or yeshiva or anything. We just kind of get together and have a learning program. Uh, we also had some some kids from the community who were, you know, in public school. They might have been a little disenfranchised. There were some kids that, you know, were, were actually kicked out of school. They would learn with us. So we would kind of take them under our wing at the time and teach them uh, some good values and just uh, be in a positive environment. And uh, we uh, actually did have a name for it. We called it Yeshiva Simcha Sachayim, the <laughs> Yeshiva for the Joy of Life. And uh, it was just a cute little nickname that we gave it and we get pizza. So I spoke to the person with the video camera that was there. And I said, you know, this is just a, a small group of guys who are just, you know, hanging out. What, what's, what's going on? What's, what's the recording about? And that person was Shimon Koyakov is his name. And he's a, uh, a person who had a, a video recording. Uh, it was a video uh, repair and a camera repair or a computer repair shop in Queens on Main Street. Uh, and... He said, you know, I started uh, recording different rabbis in the community about a month ago. Shimon himself came from a background where at eight years old, he walked into his, his family's Bukharian. Uh, and he and his brother, Ruben, who are my partners at Torah Anytime, we were all there 17 years ago when this started, almost 17 years. And uh, he, he at eight years old, walked into a store to buy his mother, his dear mother. He wanted to buy her a, a necklace, a piece of jewelry. So it cost him six bucks. He bought this necklace for her. He gave it to her at the end of the day. He says, Ma, happy birthday. I love you. It was her birthday. And, uh, you know, cute eight-year-old Shimon. Um, he saw all like a flinch on his mom's face. She's like, something was, she said, thank you so much. I love you. But see, he knows his mom really well. And something was off. So later on, she uh, she came to him and uh, she showed him the necklace. And she says, you see this symbol? It was a, it was a cross <laughs> that he had bought her. <laughs> and so she felt like, what am I doing? How am I, my identity as a Jewish person? And we we escaped prosecution, all the persecution in uh, in, in 
uh, the Uzbekistan that we went through and we moved to Forest Hills, Queens. And now here we are and our son, you know, our eldest son bought me a cross. He, he doesn't, obviously doesn't know where we came from or who we are. I'm, I'm not doing a good enough job. You know, so shit sparked up in her, see from an action like that, sparked up in her the, the, uh, the will and the desire to get him into an after school program. Uh, he still had Shimon fast forwarding many years later till when he was he owned a computer store. He still had many friends and family who were not connected to any type of uh, you know religion or spirituality, and and he just he he was so inspired himself on what he learned through going to classes at uh, in Forest Hills Jewish Center and at uh, Beth Gavriel, that's uh, main the main Bukharian bastion of uh, the Bukharian life in Queens, New York, in Forest Hills, and. Uh, he was so inspired and he knew that people he knew would never walk into a Torah class. They wouldn't, they didn't have Zoom at the time. This is 2006. They didn't have any video conferencing or any technology like we do today, which is so ubiquitous and that everybody's using. Uh, but he uh, he decided to start burning CDs, burning DVDs. So when I when I met him at Rabbi Albaum's, I said, this sounds amazing. I'm coming in tomorrow. I have a few hours during the day. Let me see your operation. Let me see what's going on. I just got out of the Israeli army. I know a thing or two about operations and logistics. And uh, let me let me help. Let me see what I could do to, to enhance and aid what you have going on. It was really fledgling. It didn't have uh, a website yet. We didn't have a name. We have, it's called uh, kolyakov.org after Shimon's grandfather that he wanted to honor. And... Um, this is uh, after, obviously, Shimon was learning for years in uh, Rabbi Zalman Deutscher uh, from uh, Yeshiva Primary, had, had an after-school program. Shimon was, um, you know, just uh, coming along, and, and he really grew so much in his faith and his spirituality. And uh, so at the time, when we were in Queens, we had these eight CD burners. I don't know if you ever see these CD, these towers that have, you know, we make copies of discs and hand out discs to people in the, in the early days of Torah anytime. Uh, it was... There wasn't even fast forward and rewind uh, able uh, capabilities on a computer yet, and it was before Google even bought YouTube. There was six minute. Six minute was the maximum amount you were able to uh, upload to to any um, server, you know, to any any place. And uh, then it moved to eleven minutes. And once Google bought you know YouTube and became more of an entity, it, everything got uh, you know it's enhanced from there. Uh, but this is this is way before people had smartphones in their pockets. Uh, there was not any. It was a desert. The online Torah learning space was a desert. Um, Chabad was the only one who had you know audio classes available for download. Uh, there were some video classes available from somebody named Five Smiles who had a site called um, was it six thirteen dot org. 613.org. And then there was Torah Lab, Rabbi uh, Haber out of, uh, he used to be living in Australia, now he's in Ramat Shemesh, and he had some things. And this was really early days. People were still having Torah tape libraries, of uh, uh, Applebaum out of uh, Brooklyn and the things like that people were picking up. And it was just barely moving over to like CDs and DVDs was like, you know, right, right in that zone. Uh, and you can imagine from then to now how technology has grown and how we've seen such an enhancement and advancement in, in, in things that we do. So our goal and our mission, we knew that technology was being used for a, a whole bunch of bad things, besides for distracting people from daily life. And this is even before social media. So you can imagine once social media came into play, how much more so, uh, you know, the, the the fight became a more, more much more amped up, the fight for spirituality, as I mentioned before, Rabbi Epstein, that uh, it was, it's, it's such a, it's such a battle. There's a, there's a physical battle that we're waging war because we need to win. We need to be able to bring this world closer to light and health, uh, emotional, emotional health, mental health, physical health, of course. But then there's then there's the spiritual war. Uh, so you have the both both parts, the goof and the neshama, the body and the soul, so to speak. And uh, we're always in that balance here. But uh, we work as best as we can to, to fight that fight and to. Uh, overcome all the negative forces and all not to mention the billions of dollars that's being pumped into the advertising industry and the media industry and uh, you know Netflix and Hulu and all the sites that uh, people zone out people who love to just uh, you know have mindless entertainment or not mindless entertainment but something that that's just not meaningful and so our aim our our battle with that that front is really to spread as much light of Torah as we can and connect as many people to meaningful, powerfully positive 
information as they can, plug them in, tap them in during the day uh, from, you know, from, from somebody who's uh, uh, living out in the middle of, of Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, to you know, somebody who's a, a blue collar, you know, Hasidish worker who's uh, out in Brooklyn fixing, doing plumbing, running from house to house, and he has earbuds like this in his ear, and he has a class on, and, you know, or to, to somebody who has ALS. I visited uh, not too long ago somebody in Muncie who's uh, an uh, incredible person, um, I don't know, um, blanking on his name, but uh, he is so inspiring. And uh, I'd love to, I'll send anybody here if you want his uh, information, his story, it will give you chills. It's incredible how he speaks with his eyes and he is, his wife holds up a, a Lucite paper that he's able to look and wherever he looks, that's the letter that he wants to to say and it sp spells out because he lost all the function, most of the functionality of his body and his body is, is systematically over time shutting down as uh, ALS will do. Uh, and he is such a tzaddik, he's such a righteous person. He sits and learns all day long. I walked into his study and it's palpable. You can feel the feeling of, of holiness and, and kedusha of, of, of sanctity in his in his place where he where he lives in his study. And uh, really incredible uh, people that we have the merit to reach every single day. Uh, so these are, these are the kind of people that we're reaching and, and everybody in between and everybody from all walks of life uh, are using Torah anytime. Uh, we never could have imagined that it would be what it is today. We have over 12 million hours of Torah learning that's being learned every single year on the website and through the mobile app. And we also have a phone system that people dial into and publications that we uh, get out there to all four corners of the world. Um, do uh, uh, books and uh, short things about the holidays and weekly newsletters and anything you can imagine. Our goal is to have Torah be accessible and engaging and relevant. That goes along with uh, making sure that we have all of the technology that's necessary for somebody to really understand the content, not just to be have it be thrown at them, but what's relevant to you, what speaks to you. What's going to really, you know, make you come back and say, hey, you know what, that that actually was, was life enhancing. Mm -hmm. It may be a better parent, maybe a better teacher, it may be a better student, maybe a better son, a better brother, a better husband, wife, whoever it is that recognizes that this is actually helping and actually relevant to me in my life right now. Or it's offering guidance and inspiration and meaning to the challenges that we all go through as human beings in this world. And uh, that's the that's the promise of Torah, that's the promise that Hashem gave to Moses at Mount Sinai, and we now have it today. Of course, everything we do is free. I don't, I don't know about, of course, but you know, it <laughs> takes money to run any organization, but everything that we, we put out there is free. We'll never charge for Torah. It's in our dictum, it's our credo. Uh, Moshe got it from Hashem at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, we, we will never charge a dollar or cent for, for any of it. It's, it's straight from, you know, from, from the heavens to us, and it's, uh, it's divine. Uh, so you know, we we love what we do. We're passionate about it, uh, like so many Jews in the world and so many people in the world today that are just finding themselves. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, the landscape after October seventh. I'll speak about that for a moment. Was uh, I'm sure everybody that heard what happened was was floored, horrified. How could this happen? How could this be? Uh, was my first reaction on on Simchas Torah on the day that we're dancing around. With, the, one of the holiest days of the year that we're in, in such a state of joy and happiness that that this is how it happens and and uh, I found out I was in I was in Shul it was by uh, by doing the Hakafa circuits you know around the uh, Bima and Shul and uh, somebody had a, a nanny um, in the in the community somebody had like a nanny who was looking at the news on that day and then other people were only keeping one day because they were in Israel and this was the second day in America. So people were buzzing about something that happened and we were all just, you know, gathering as much information as we could. Uh, once we got something conclusive and understood what, what actually happened, uh, we just following the news very closely. Uh, immediately, I didn't do, I didn't do uh, anything. I didn't jump on a plane like some of my friends and said, I'm going, I'm there, I'm going to be there, whatever it is, I don't care, running headfirst into battle doesn't matter. You know, I'm, I'm a member of a fighting force of trained soldier of, of, state of Israel and the people of Israel, I will not, you know, stand by and let this happen. And that was my instinct. That's what I, I would have loved to do. Uh, I have a wife, I have four beautiful children, God bless them 
the amazing, amazing family uh, and responsibilities to tour anytime. And uh, I, I first I sought spiritual guidance. You know, I wanted to know what what was the right thing to do, and given my circumstances. Uh, so my my hishtadlut, my efforts that that I did was to take my name off of a list. I, I had and when I left the army it was during the, the dis disengagement from Gaza, and it was a very tough time. Uh, it was a really tough time in particular because we were giving up so much land uh, ostensibly in the name of peace, but we saw that that really didn't work after we had given up the land that we did. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we just got missiles shot at us from closer you know, to our borders and they ripped down, uh, you know, everybody took over there, ripped, ripped down all the greenhouses that we gave them and all the promise of industry and all the things that we really handed to, to them and said, here, make something of it. We built this up for you. And you, you say you want peace. Here you go. Here's our olive branch this is what we're giving to you. And, you know, Jews were going into, there's a whole movement in Israel at the time uh, called Yehudi Lo Megaresh Yehudi, a Jew does not uh, displace another Jew from their home. And it was a big political unrest. Uh, I was in the army and I, I was signing on more time than, than my service was allotted for uh, because I didn't want to leave my unit. And I, I knew what it was going to be like if I did. Uh, it would be harder work for everybody else. And what was I going back for to, to go to America and go to college? I was living the highest purpose and I put on that uniform and and wearing the flying the flag and flying the colors of Israel. And every single day, I knew I was getting up to help people that you know were were able to sleep better at night, go to work in the morning, be with their families. And I was proud and happy to be out there, just like I always am, just like I did for this past tour of Miluim and every other time since, uh, to you know, to serve my people. It's really. Uh, it's it's a higher calling, and I say that with humility. I don't, don't think of myself as any more or less special than anybody else in in our amazing, amazing nation. Uh, I know that everybody who's fulfilling their purpose and is passionate about what they're doing and using their God-given talents for good in this world to the best of their ability, it, we're all in the same boat. We're all the most inspirational, the highest level that we can be at when we're when we're in the game, when we're when we're stepping up and we're doing what we need to do. And I, I might have the ability to be a soldier and to, to fight and go out and, you know, to, to do guard duty at three in the morning with Moshe Wolf on the top of a mountain with with F-16s flying over our heads, you know, and we're like, go get them, go get them. Yeah. You know, and, and just that feeling, the passion, the energy of like uh, uh, we're waving to the pilots like I hope they could see us. <laughs> just, I hope they're able to, to see what we're up to. And uh, and then you hear the boom, you know, and. and War is, is a terrible, terrible thing on one hand. And on the other hand, it's 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 a, an issue and a challenge that's been uh plaguing us. You know, the 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 what was what was created in the times when we, we carved out Gaza as a strip to you know to deal with this this challenge and this issue and, and we hadn't addressed it for so long. And when something festers for that long, you know, ultimately uh, you can't brush something under the rug for that long and and you know things got came to a head um there was definitely uh challenge challenges and mistakes that uh were made uh now's not the time to go on a witch hunt and find out you know what was wrong and what were those problems and issues that'll happen they'll you know they'll figure it out and make sure that it never ever happens again please god and uh we're here to make sure that happens we're here to, to make sure that uh we could do everything humanly possible uh, and also spiritually possible with Torah learning and with prayer, because that affects a, an enormous change in this world. And it's a great power that we all have to to uh, to really tap into the connection that we have and, and understand who we are. I'm sure it, every, not everybody, but I, I'd imagine that uh, people here uh, learn with Rabbi Epstein and maybe learn some Hasidus mm -hmm. and uh, get into yeah, really the the feelings and and uh, the 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 energy that that that. You know, really, really does have it have make a difference, uh, and I'm sure everybody's heard very inspirational stories about uh, things that could not be orchestrated in any by any means by by mankind of coincidences, you know that that just went on uh, of people helping people and saving people and the you know the pictures of bullets you know on people's vests and stopped right by a sitter you know if you've seen that one I mean it's it's so so amazing and. To be part of that is such a privilege and it's so humbling. 
uh, from, from a wider perspective and also from an internal perspective of being part of an army that is a brotherhood, is a family. Everybody really, truly cares about each other. Uh, you know, don't really, in, in the area of the army where, where, where we just were, um, and maybe going back to uh, sometime in the near future, uh, we'll see what happens with, uh, happens in Lebanon and Gaza and, uh, you know, could very well get called up again. And uh, so uh, just finishing the, the point I was making before about my, my effort that I was making, my Hishtad Boot, was that I took myself off of a list of uh, having that patur, I got I got a uh, uh, exemption from going back to doing military service uh, because of the because of the you know the disengagement. What they ended up doing is splitting up all of the people who were connected to a yeshiva. There's a split, unfortunately, between you know it's very much a stark contrast between the goals of the yeshiva system and the goals that the military might have. And the yeshiva and, and rabbis of, in the country were very against kicking Jews out of their home to make room for uh, people who want to hate, who want to kill us and and, and destroy us. Uh, and the government said, "Well, you know, sorry, the, there was a vote. This is what we decided, and we're going through with it." So what the what the uh, government did is they took these yeshiva students and they split us up into different different zones. It kind of disbanded uh, us so that just in case. Uh, somebody would listen to their their rabbi over the military. They would have you know three or four people who would be not listening and there'd be uh, called Saref Pekuda, burning a command basically, and and uh, they would get court martialed and you know punished and things like that. But soldiers are very strong willed uh, people, so it wouldn't it wouldn't matter you know if uh, if one rabbi said that and and forty people did that. That's a big problem for the army. That's an operational issue. That's a security risk. Uh, and so they they were very smart uh, and they split up all the yeshiva students in different areas. And because of that, uh, I, I had a uh, an opportunity to not sign on more time from the time I was there. Uh, I was I was torn. For me, it was a very, very tough decision. It was a very challenging time for me. Um, and uh, ultimately, I decided you know to to take a step back and uh, finish my service. That was in, uh, in 2000 and 2006, and that's when I came back to America, uh, and I met Shimon, and uh, you know started started uh, being the first first tour anytime volunteer. Uh, but uh, fast forwarding, fast forwarding to now, uh, we've come such a long way, and we've seen so much growth, and we've plugged away, and we're dedicated, and had such hard work, and now where we're holding is in a state of. Uh, strength, passion, power, and also it's very tenuous. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. Nobody has a crystal ball. You know, we could pray as much as, as we can pray, but still nobody can see the future. We do know we have faith. We have faith and it keeps us together as a people, as a nation. And it, the, the kindness and the love that we're able to share and to give each other and the strength that we have physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, really is a testament to the fact that there's no wonder why we're still here. Hashem gave us a promise that he's never going to abandon his people. And he holds to that. He holds true to that. We know that for sure. You can, you can take that to the bank, that that uh, that, that uh, understanding and knowledge that every everything that we do is for a purpose and a reason. And every tsar, every pain that we go through is also for a reason. And we can't know what those reasons are. We don't, it's beyond my pay grade to understand, you know, why. I think it's very... Um, egotistical for me to think, why should I have the answers? Like I need to have the answers to this question. I need to know why, 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 who am I? Uh, who am I to know, to know what Hashem has his, his master plan and what he has in store. Uh, I'm, I'm just here to do a job, to do my duty, keep my head down, do the best I can. And at the end of the day to go to sleep every night after I say Shema prayer, to know that I, I did it with integrity I did it with as much passion and focus. And yes, I fell and yes, I messed up, but I got back up again and I did I did my best again and I still you know, fell, but I still did a better job than I did yesterday. And I took one baby step forward and that's, a, that's all that keeps me going and understanding the framework that we have as, as a people and as a nation, um, that we have Torah to guide us, that we have the, the wisdom of our elders and of our sages who told us and they revealed so many things from down from back from Shimon Bar Yochai and really back from Moshe Rabbeinu and really back from the beginning of time from uh, from Adam from the first man 
who we know we have we have a connection to, to so much wisdom and depth, uh, really tapped into the creator of the universe who gave it over to us and to make sense of things and understand things uh, is is phenomenal and it's a huge power. Yet we still have the same struggles in this world that we've that we've always had and that we may always have until t- times of the Messiah until Mashiach comes, uh, which hopefully will be very very soon. So uh, that with that, I you know the, you know my whole wow. life story now. You know my I, you know I can and I can I can go on and on, but uh, I want to please that I don't want to. So thank you so much. Time. First of all, the way you you, you your your ability to um, uh, you know, serve Klal Yisrael. You know the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, through intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Wow, that's all I can say is wow. We're gonna open up if, if you will stay with us for a few more minutes. We'll be respectful of uh, of our guests' time. If people want to unmute and jump in with a real brief, quick question. Uh, please, um, we wanted to be respectful of his time. Sure, Smadar. Yeah. So, um, I hear from you like. 6 30 in the morning october 7th i'm just i would like to if possible just walk me through a little bit of what happened in those moments for you so the the or where shocking, were you sh- sh- i was uh at uh 6 30 in the morning on october 7th it was at 6 30 you're talking about eastern time or you're talking about when the attack happened because for us it was a uh, totally different. Uh, it was, I was in I was in America at the time. Oh, um, oh, I live in oh, Muncie. And, oh, yeah, so, I wasn't so in Israel. no, so then it's different. Yeah, it's a, the, now I understand. So when did you get Das Torah to go back? So so my my Das Torah said that that if I felt strongly and and it wasn't a question that how strongly I felt uh, that. That, that my my efforts would be to to remove myself from this list of an exemption and put myself on the I'm available list and if you need me I'm there and I did that and and within five minutes I had gotten a call from somebody who said they need soldiers in this place in this area and wow. I I reached out and a few minutes later I had a connection and communication they said yes we need you to come uh, I told them I gave them my information I told them you know where I, where I served and what I did and and uh, I was on a flight uh, four days later I was there and uh, you know ready to go so, so you were in the in the Hebron, in the Hebron area is that what you were saying in the Hebron area yeah we, we uh, patrol uh-huh. the road that would go outside of Hebron and we made sure that uh, you know the villages around there were at bay and everybody yeah. who was supposed to you know, stay where they were supposed to stay stayed there and that the people on a particular yeshuv called Shima that they were safe and uh-huh. we operated in that area and that was our our our, our gizra as we call it our zone uh, we had a lot of different uh jobs yeah. that we did mainly guarding and protecting and making sure that the roads were safe for people to travel and uh that was our our main objective was just safety and security well, yeshal kochacha that you're uh, doing this for all of us. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. Sure. My pleasure. Okay. Otherwise, we're, we're going to say goodnight. Thank you so much for all the things you're doing. I feel like we should have you on for three different separate you know, evenings. One to talk about your IDF service, one to talk about Torah anytime, and to hear your story. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining us. We'll see you yeah, tomorrow night for learning. And uh, Yashakoach to you. If I could, before, before, yeah, please. But that's what I was going to say. Plug it. We just launched a new interface yesterday. It's very exciting. It's really amazing. Everybody should just jump on and just uh, TorahAnytime.com. Just like it sounds. <laughs> TorahAnytime.com. And you said 20 million hours of classes. 12 million hours are being learned. Oh, every well, that's year. that you could do. <laughs> we're reaching, we're going to reach 20 million. We're going to, together, we we're going to do it. Absolutely. 120. Beautiful. Thank you, Yashikoa, for all thank of you, the things you. and for coming on and joining us. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night.